Hey, welcome everybody to an episode, another episode of Ask Dr. B Live. Dr. B, how are you doing today? I'm doing just great, thank you. Um, just same, same, same old tricks, you know, staying <laughs> as uh, calm and cool and collected as I can with this whole COVID thing, you know, trying to, trying to stay out of trouble. Yeah. yeah Full-time job though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Today, uh, everybody, we are going to be talking about return to sport, return to play, return to activity, return to everyday life, even, um, depending on what your everyday life entails. Uh, but over the months, I guess, over a year now, maybe, that I've been talking with Dr. B and we've been working together, um, she's always talked about, you know, one of the biggest issues that she saw with whether it's professional athletes or everyday athletes, especially is when they get injured and they return to play uh, too soon without doing the following the proper steps, they just get re-injured. Uh, so Dr. B is going to share her wealth of experience on how to go about safely returning to your sport, your activity or gym or whatever it is uh, without re-injury. So I'm really looking forward to this. And after Dr. B shares her little presentation, um, I am going to talk to her and be the case study and you, you'll get to see Dr. B in action. So Dr. Okay. B, thanks again for being here and take it away. Okay, thank you so much, Eric. Um, no, I, I'm actually looking forward to this because um, it, it's a common problem that, um, you know, that I see and it's, it's, it's frustrating um, for patients to sort of navigate this, uh, you know, what do you do? What are the criteria? And, and so I'm hoping today that we can review some of the common pitfalls that I hear and that I see when people are trying to get back to their sport to teach you how to listen to your body, how to listen to your symptoms so that you know whether you um, can progress, whether you need to regress, kind of wait a little bit um, and, and just how to go about uh, getting back to your sport. And, you know, a lot of this really revolves around why we develop wear and tear injuries in the first place. Um, and, and comes back to two basic principles. The two common things that I see um, are that people either don't have a foundation for movement, and you remember that this foundation for movement has to do with the performance pyramid. And so here our performance pyramid is actually upside down, that a foundation for movement means that you've got good alignment of your joints, you've got balance of the soft tissue and strength around your joints, and that you're using the correct muscles. So the ABCs of foundation for movement. And then when we think about playing a sport or doing an activity, you have to have sort of levels of um, function within your body in order to be successful and not wear your body out. So if you want to throw a hundred mile an hour fastball that requires strength, power, and speed. If you're trying to throw a hundred mile an hour fastball and you don't have any um, strength in your shoulder, or if you don't have good range of motion in your shoulder, you're going to be overloading your body and your body's going to break down. And so today uh, we're going to be really focusing on the um, not so much the acute stage where you've had your injury and you've got pain and swelling, but you've kind of recovered. And now you're thinking about, okay, when do I go back to my sport? And just as a, a reminder that um, Eric and I have developed a, a four phase strategy for injury recovery. So you have an incident where you develop say pain and swelling in your knee um, or you dislocate your shoulder there, you know, there's an event that affects your body. You then have to allow the acute swelling inflammation to settle down. You have to let the tissues heal that have potentially been damaged you have to prevent fibrosis. So that's the relaxation phase. And then you have to make sure that you're using the correct muscles and that you've restored motion and strength, uh, the balance around your joints. And then you have to put it all together and reintegrate your functional movements. Then you're ready because you have a foundation for movement to start going back to uh, your usual sporting activities or gardening or wh whatever it is that you wanna do that place a bit more demand on your system. So we have to, um, or, or one of the most common problems that I see is that people have an injury, um, say they uh, dislocate their shoulder and they've got pain, 
they've got some limited motion. And very commonly when people dislocate their shoulder recurrently, that pain and swelling and loss of motion will settle down very quickly after the acute event. And after maybe four or five days, they think, okay, I'm fine. I'm, I'm gonna go right back to my activity. So instead of kind of crawling and then walking and then running, they go from crawling to flying. And so they jump up that performance pyramid too quickly. And they haven't necessarily reestablished their foundation for movement. I know that as soon as somebody has had an event, um, swelling in a joint, significant pain in a joint, that the muscles around that joint are going to be wacky. They're gonna be asleep, they're not gonna be functioning properly, and that is a risk. That tells me that you don't have a foundation for movement. So the criteria that I use for return to play is that you have, um, have a foundation for movement, which means that you have a normal range of motion. So you can test the range of motion from your uninjured to your injured side. And if you're lacking like two degrees or three degrees, that's not necessarily an issue. It depends if the activity that you want to do requires that specific range of motion, then it's a problem, but uh, you can get away with a few degrees. You have to have a decrease in your acute pain. Uh, I prefer that you have no pain whatsoever when you're getting ready to go back to your activity. But if you're less than a two out of a 10, with 10 being maximum pain, pain so severe that you'd go to the eMERGE, um, so two is really very, very minor pain, then um, you can start thinking about returning in a very uh, controlled manner to your activity. You should have minimal to no swelling. And again, I prefer no swelling. Uh, you have to have restored at least 80% of your strength and balance to the extremity. And you have to be able to move with a normal rhythm. So if you can't walk without a limp, then you shouldn't be running. If you can't move your arm through, if you wanna throw or if you wanna hit a tennis serve, if you can't take your arm through that action without losing the mechanics, so you have to have normal mechanics, then you're not ready to go back to your sport. And I think it's really smart before you, you go back to any kind of activity that you test the movement in a controlled manner first. Um, I remember when I was working for the uh, Toronto Maple Leafs in the NHL, uh, we had a player who was having recurrent anterior knee problems and he was kind of getting better. And then as soon as he'd go back, he would, you know, he'd get sore again and management was like, okay, look, I want an MRI, get an MRI, tell me whether he's ready. And I'm like, well, an MRI isn't, isn't going to tell us whether he's ready or not. You know, you can have a normal MRI, but he can have, swelling in the, or, well, he won't have, he would detect swelling on an MRI. So, um, but you could have a normal MRI and not have good strength in the leg. Um, and so I like um, having people do some, some movements that would be simulating movements that they'd have to um, do when they're participating in their sport. So if, if uh, he couldn't do 10 single leg jumps, hops on his leg, without pain and without any kind of problem and kind of sticking the, sticking the landing, I don't think he's going to be able to go and compete in an NHL game. So um, that's one thing. Oftentimes you'll wonder, oh, should I have a test? Well, if you've had a fracture, for example, if you've broken a bone, getting an x-ray can be very beneficial because it can tell you whether the fracture has healed or not healed. But the fracture um, or the x-ray is not going to tell you the condition of the soft tissues. It's not going to tell you about range of motion necessarily or the strength. And so all of these other criteria need to be met. And then um, you should test yourself in, in, with simple movements and then progress to complex. So let's say you try to do the single leg hop and you, you go, ow, your knee hurts. Then you know that you're not ready. So then you shouldn't be hopping on your leg, but you can then try doing a simple lunge and you want to keep the movements initially very linear so that you're moving in a straight line so that you're not having to bring in too much of your balance system. And when you, then when you can do the simple movement, then you can add in um, side lateral movement. And then when you can do forwards and backwards and side to side, then you can bring in rotational movements. So you need to test things um, and, and return to things in a, in a controlled way and a progressive way 
so that you're not jumping up that performance pyramid too quickly. So Eric, why don't you just tell what happened to you uh, a few weeks ago? Sure. And uh, for those of you watching, those are not my knees. I don't have my legs. <laughs> my legs aren't that hairy. I'm, I'm Chinese. I'm Chinese. We don't have that much hair. Um, but yeah, so what I was doing is I was, I was doing some tennis serves and I didn't warm up. I was just actually planning on just doing a hit a couple of balls and for a video, I wanted to do a quick little video. And uh, I got my video footage that I wanted and then I just kept serving and I was going for it. And it was on the landing. So when I serve, I kind of jump up a little bit and I land on my left leg, only on one leg. And on one of the landings, it, it tweaked a little bit. No real severe pain or anything like that, but it tweaked a little bit. And then I was fine, rode my bike back home. And then that evening I had some swelling, some stiffness, some pain. And that was about, that was about three or four weeks ago now. <clears throat> so um, that, was, that was the event. That was what happened. Yeah. And so um, Eric, I actually didn't see Eric's knee for a couple of weeks. And, um, you know, he still had, he had pretty profound swelling in the knee. So this is not his knee, but he had an obvious effusion in the knee. So if you look at, this is looking at the front of the knee, you can see the kneecap here. And over on this side where there's swelling, you can see that we lose this dimple on the inside of the joint. And when we look inside, if this is looking at the normal anatomy on the far left, we've got the femur, which is the thigh bone that's up here. We've got the patella, which you can see here. And then we've got the tibia, which is the lower leg bone. Now this is looking at it from the side, not from the front, with pictures from the front. But you can see that the, the capsule and the pouch of the knee goes about a hand, a hand one hand's breadth above the patella. So if I were to measure, this is the upper border of the patella, I know that the, the capsule of the knee can go up to about here. So the swelling on this person's knee is moderate. It could be worse. It could go even fuller and that would be really, really tense, painful swelling. So sometimes people will say, oh, well, I've got swelling out here or I've got swelling only in here. But really when you have this kind of swelling, it, it actually is a communication throughout the whole inside of the joint itself. So um, we've got, uh, when, you, when I hear Eric's story, I'm thinking to myself, okay, it could be a meniscus. He'd had a meniscus problem before. Um, it could be, <clears throat> excuse me, it could be his, um, his kneecap. Um, it could be maybe articular cartilage somewhere in the joint, uh, or it could be the fat pad. Um, and it's because of the jumping. I know that with the jumping and the repetitive jumping, that this is something, how many, how many serves did you do, Eric? confess oh uh by the end of that session over 100 for sure over, over 100 so that's yeah. a lot of serving that's a lot <laughs> I was, that's, I, was that's a, I was having fun <laughs> that's a lot of serving so you know repetitively jumping and landing um i'm thinking mm, could be somewhere you know something in his in the, in the in the front of his knee quadriceps tendon patellar tendon you know little cartilage underneath the kneecap the fat pad so um I hadn't had a chance to see Eric and, you know, he said, Oh, you know, the, yeah, it's swollen. And, um, and then you were icing and you're doing some things and, and it's, it, it wasn't that painful. It didn't seem like you, you were out on your, I think you were out on a skateboard or something. Like yeah. It, I was just, that was just like just testing it out when I was with the kids. Um, okay. But, so, but he, you know, he was kind of like limited for sure because of the swelling, but he was still walking around and, and doing things. And so I then I, I saw you a couple of weeks ago and had a chance to examine your knee. And actually, if we just go back here, when I felt his knee, he was primarily tender right at the base of the kneecap beside the, the patellar tendon, kind of right in this area. And when, I, when we bend his knee up and we would feel the joint line, you can, and you can feel the joint line, there didn't feel like there was any bulge from the meniscus. Um, so that was a good thing, but he was really tender right in this area, which would be kind of right where the fat pad is and right where his patellar tendon come, come together. But he wasn't tender on the front of the knee where if it was patellar tendonitis, I'd be thinking, well, he'd be tender here, but he wasn't really tender there. So 
in my differential diagnosis, and I can't be 100% certain, um, but I'm thinking that he either landed and a little tiny piece of cartilage came from underneath the kneecap. So this is an arthroscope, oop, sorry. Okay. Oh, I've got a little, there we go. Sorry, a little, uh, little technical glitch there. Uh, I got excited. Um, this is an arthroscopic view of the, the kneecap. So we're looking at the undersurface of the patella. This is the thigh bone, the femoral trochlea, and this is absolutely normal cartilage here. And this isn't Eric's knee either. Uh, we didn't scope him between now and last week, but this is, I'm sorry, I don't know what I'm doing here with my, I'm flicking my, uh, I'm trying to show you things and I think I'm accidentally moving it to the next slide. Let's see if we can uh, go back again. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna stop moving around so much here. So you can see the normal articular cart. Oh. Okay, this isn't making me happy, sorry. I'm just gonna describe it. I'm not moving the mouse this time because my, my I don't know what's happening, but um, you can see the stuff that looks like a shag rug on the far right. That is thinning of the articular cartilage and the articular cartilage itself is not normal. And you can, and, and if this is Eric's knee, Eric, don't worry. You can have a knee that looks like this and be completely pain-free and function for the rest of your life without any symptoms. But what can happen sometimes is when a little frond of that cartilage falls off and floats around inside the knee, it creates this inflammatory response. And so then with the inflammation, your, your, your knee blows up, you get swollen. When the knee blows up and is swollen like that, it shuts off your quad. And within 24 to 48 hours, you can see atrophy of the quadricep muscle. So on the left, and I'm afraid to touch the screen, um, I want to though. Okay, I've got the arrow. Actually, if you can see the arrow, it's at the top of what would be the fat pad. Now we're looking more at the side of the knee. There's the patella, which is on the far right, and the, femor the femoral, um, femoral condyle is on the left. And that kind of yellow white material that's in the middle is the fat pad. And so the fat pad can actually get impinged between the patella and the femur. And if you pinch it, then it can get inflamed, it can be painful, and it can cause swelling. So um, those were the two things that I was thinking could potentially be going on in Eric's knee as a result of all that, cra all that crazy serving, which I understand because I do it myself. Um, now, the good thing is, is that, okay, so what have you done in the, since it was swollen, what have you done? Um, <clears throat> continued to ice, uh, continued to do quadriceps activation. I uh, started to bring in some calf and some hamstring work. Um, and then just normal other joints. I've, all, I've been working my other joints, my ankles, my hips, upper body, of course. Metatarsal pressure. Yeah, all that stuff. Glute activation. Um, yep. And then I, so I went out for, I've been doing some biking. So with the seat up high, just riding the spin bike, I could do that. No problem. No swelling afterwards. Went out for a light rollerblade a couple times and no problems there. The only issue that I've run into randomly actually is, and I think I've identified it as when the lower limb, the tibia fibula rotates internally relative to the femur, mm -hmm. a couple times there it's caught. So it's not every time I've tested okay. it and it's not every time, but it's been random kind of not when I'm paying attention and testing it, but when I'm in everyday life and I'm kind of say, if I'm rotating around and twisting my body to the left, my upper mm -hmm. body, and then my left foot is planted. Uh, that's when I think it, it's caught a couple of times, maybe, maybe two, three times over the past few weeks. Okay. Um, so there's a couple of things. Um, let's address that rotational issue. Um, mm. One, I think that you should work on making sure you've got good tibial rotation now. Yep. So um, you know what to do. <laughs> yeah. do you want to 
why don't you describe to people in case they've had this experience what okay. they should do? Um, the way I would start would be open chains or lying on my back with a flexed knee. And my knee, so say my, my femur, my upper thigh is pointing straight up to the ceiling. My knee is kind of relaxed and bent. I would just rotate my heel in and out, back and forth, and do a little bit of that, and then do that with some knee extension and flexion, all in the, the supine, lying on my back position. So that's how I would start. And so what Eric can do is actually check and see is the rotation of his tibia on his femur equivalent comparing the right to the left. And if he's lacking some, then what can be happening is when he's planting and he's rotating because the tibia and the femur aren't rotating the way that they should be, the patella can get trapped, the fat pad could get trapped, or you think a little bit about a meniscus. Um, but if your knee is primarily an extension, uh, a meniscus tear would be unusual, but if meniscus, I'd be thinking very anterior horn meniscus tear if it's there. Mm. But the tenderness on Eric's knee was up higher, closer to the base of the patella than down lower on the tibia, which makes me think more of patella and fat pad. Mm. So the other thing that um, you can do with when you have problems with that tibial rotation is actually get the fibula and the tibia moving properly. So there's a little joint called the tib fib joint. And you guys, if you've put your hand on your knee, just on the outside of your knee, you'll feel the top of that little bone. It's called the fibula and you can actually grab it. And then you can try and move it forwards and backwards and you can change the rotation of your foot on the ground. So if you're just sitting with your feet flat, your knees bent at 90, you can rotate your tibia in by pointing your toes together like pigeon toed or rotate your foot to the outside. When you rotate your foot to the outside, you won't be able to move that proximal tib fib joint at all. But as you um, rotate in, you'll be able to get it to move a little bit more. And you can't have the muscles contracted at all on your lower limb when you try to get that moving, because if you, if you do, then the muscles prevent the joint from moving. So, um, and you can also do this with your test it with your foot in different um, degrees of plantar and dorsiflexion, but usually just the foot in neutral is best or slight dorsiflexion. So I would make sure that that little joint is moving properly as well. So what we're talking about here really for Eric is making sure that he's got good balance and alignment of all of the segments of his knee before he can actually start really progressing. But it sounds like in your pain is pretty low at this point now, Eric, like it's, yeah, yeah, I went for a little jog uh, this morning, actually. Um, oh, okay. not, be not because I wanted to, because I had to get somewhere and pick up my car. But uh, so that the only thing that I notice now is a little bit of it's a little bit of weakness, and okay. almost like an internal, like a neuro inhibition type of weakness, not so much a muscular strength weakness. So some right. kind of limitation or limiting is going on there. Did your knee swell after doing uh, that? Looking at it, no, it looks okay. So that's really positive. So, okay, so when you have that feeling that Eric is describing, that's a really good feeling to listen to. It's just kind of like, um, it's not quite normal. The range is, I'm not losing my range. So like, if he had said to me after that, that, okay, my knee became painful as I'm sitting here and it's feeling stiff and it's swelling up, then I'd say, okay, don't jog again. But the fact that, he's feeling pretty good, it's not swelling, it's not stiffening up, then really now what he has to do is sort of push the envelope a little bit in a smart way, where he will do a little jog, just a light one, test it out, you feel great. Tomorrow, he would just do sort of rehab exercises and maybe some strengthening and he could maybe go on the bike if he wanted to get his heart going. Um, so that he's not doing the same thing over and over again to create imbalance. And then the day after, if everything's great, then he could try a little further jog. So he's going to increase his duration of the jogging before he increases the intensity. So he's not going to go out and run hard. He's going to just go slowly. And he could even start with a walk jog. And, 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 and as, as the nervous system gets confident that, okay, geez, the knee's not going to blow up and swell. The knee's not going to become painful then that feeling will go away very quickly. And in fact, he'll feel better 
if um, he actually turns on all the muscles in his hamstring and his quad and his calf and his glutes before he goes for the jog. Really make sure that everything's turned on and that all those little joints are moving properly, that his tibia is rotating properly, that the tib fib joint's moving, that his patella is moving, because that's the other thing that's important for anybody who has a patella femoral issue. So that you can roll the, you can, and actually the, on the ROM coach, you've got a, um, with the knee mobility, you've got, uh, you, you show how you can do an anterior, little anterior active self myofascial release and the posterior self myofascial release. I would do that routine before you started to increase your intensity of, or sorry, your duration of activity of jogging. Gotcha. Okay. Now, so what happens then is you go and you do your activity but, and you can be started out and you're balanced, but as you go about your activities, you recreate imbalance. So for the first little while that you're, and it may be sort of six weeks until you build endurance in your proper activation patterns so that you're not having that loss of internal rotation or you're not having um, uh, the tightness, say, in the tensor fascia lata, you know, so something could get tight again and the imbalance is recreated after you do your activity. So the key here is that you go to your activity, create imbalance, but before you do the activity again, you recreate balance. So you're always kind of going through this rhythm of recovery that you're stressing your body, then allowing your body to recover, then stressing your body again, then allowing your body to recover. And the importance of stressing the body is we know that stressing your body is going to increase the strength of the tissue. It's going to increase your muscle strength. It's what we need to do to build our body. If we're not active and we just, if Eric doesn't do anything, he's not going to be improving the tibial rotation. He's not going to be building his endurance and strength. So, you know, he could lay off things for say six weeks and then he'll say, okay, I feel great now which he probably will feel pretty good for his everyday life. But then if he said, okay, I'm going to, I got to go to shoot a video and he tries to do another hundred serves his knee will blow up again because he hasn't gone through the phases of building the endurance strength, power, and speed. So, but he has to give his body a chance to adapt. The body can't adapt instantly. It has to heal. You have to regain your foundation for movement. Then you stress, the body with duration of activities to build endurance. And then you take it to the next level where you're actually building strength. And you're going to do that by increasing the intensity of the activity. So, and you're going to do that with more controlled strengthening activities uh, to prepare your body. So exercises um, to prepare um, strength and power. So, um, the common issues that I hear that people, they go and they try to jog again and their knee blows up. So they gets really swollen and it's painful. And um, Eric has done a really good job of getting the swelling out of his knee pretty quickly. Like for a couple of weeks there, he was kind of like swollen and I think maybe doing a little too much, but not really, you know, not really that focused on getting rid of the swelling. and. Once I sort of said to him, look, you got to get rid of this swelling. He was on it and the swelling has been down and that's fantastic. And that's, what's going to allow everything to now go in the right direction. But if you still have that inflammation, then what can happen is that it starts to change the elasticity of the tissues around the knee or around whatever joint, if you have inflammation in whatever joint, then that, that makes it harder for you to establish your foundation for movement. So it all comes down to understanding that rhythm of your um, what's enough activity to stimulate growth, but not so much activity that I'm going to create breakdown inflammation, which will then start a cycle of fibrosis, inflammation, poor tissue elasticity. Um, oftentimes I, people say, okay, I've took six weeks off. I didn't do anything. I feel great. And then they go back right back to their sport. They go play a match in tennis or they get onto the, you know, they, it's a beer league and, you know, they've, they've had a, a sore shoulder, they rest, they take six weeks off, then Friday night beer league, they just go straight into the game, boom, 
shoulder sore again. Um, so people, you really have to prepare your body and establish that foundation for movement before whatever it is you're going to do. And this doesn't mean hours and hours. It means, you know, 10, 15 minutes to get your body ready, go to your sport, have fun, and then take care of yourself after. And I know that in the last few weeks we've been talking, um, people have asked, well, you know, how do you know when you stop? Like I remember Charlotte had a bunch of questions about, you know, well, I, how do you know when you need to kind of keep rebalancing or not? And you get to a point where everything feels really pretty good. Um, so you, you, and we have so many exercises and so many things to do that it becomes overwhelming. So what I suggest at that point is when everything feels great, that you do sort of something for your shoulder on Monday, something for your foot and ankle on Tuesday, something for your hip on Wednesday, something for your core on Thursday, so that you're doing different parts of your body. And, and I think here's where the ROM coach really comes in to be very beneficial that you do a, a reassessment every couple of months to see how your body has changed. And maybe you've developed an imbalance that you weren't aware of because you're moving better, you're moving with more intensity. So something is, is developing that you have no clue about. But if you do the ROM coach assessment, it'll, it'll highlight it for you. And then you just incorporate those exercises into a, a warm up or a cool down um, that you can do so that you can keep going. And um, that's about all that I have uh, to say specifically on that. Uh, and just wanted to open things up for questions um, to try and help people keep going and get back to their sport. Cause that's what the goal of all of this is, is to keep doing what you love to do. Definitely. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for the little presentation, Dr. B and for the, the coaching there. Uh, yeah. Once you, once you told me about the swelling to really get on that, I was icing that massaging it and getting it uh, really working on it. Um, so that, that helped. It dissipated pretty quickly after I really went hard at it. Good, good for you. And so now actually from where you're at, so now you can start building duration in these controlled activities and adding something to sort of build the strength, like get your strength back because you're, it's feeling sort of weak. So you're going to add exercises um, after you've done your, your duration. You don't want to be fatigued when you're doing that, but mm -hmm. you'll kind of have to, you know, better than anybody here how to do that. Um, but that would be sort of my advice. And then when you have swelling in your joint uh, that you had, you know, you had at least moderate, moderate swelling uh, in the joint. When you have moderate swelling in a joint that lasts for a couple of weeks like that, it probably will be a four to six week um, time frame before you're going to be able to get back to feel like, oh, okay, I'm feeling really pretty good. And that very last bit of end range motion flexion is going to be the hardest to get back. And that may take yeah. two or three months to come back. But okay. you don't have to necessarily limit everything you're doing between now and then. It's just a matter of building, building, building mm -hmm. and and listening. Awesome. Yeah, that was actually the first time when you saw it. That was super helpful because I didn't know what was going on. And I didn't think the swelling was that bad, but I guess it was worse than it uh, from my perspective that it looked. And uh, just the, the timelines I found super helpful when you're describing, okay, you might have chipped off a piece of cartilage there. Don't worry about it. It's not that big deal. It's like, oh, okay. You know, I, I'm not going to be stuck doing, I don't know, buns of steel for the rest of my life. That's all I can do. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, that was the, just the, the reassurance. And uh, that was, I just found that very, very helpful with my mental state and just not to think about it so much Just focus on, you know, focus on this thing swelling right now. And then that made a big difference. And I've been, playing with it and testing it since. Um, awesome. One, yeah. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for that guidance. One thing, I wanted, <laughs> one thing I wanted to highlight from your, from your presentation, maybe to give people uh, an example of building up strength in multi directions and in the planes, the different planes of motion. A, a practical example would be for myself, if I'm using the lunge movement pattern, for example, I would start out once I'm onto the strength bit, I would start out with like a split squat type lunge where my feet aren't moving. I'm just splitting my feet up and I'm going up and down stationary. So I'd start with that type of exercise. That's very, you're not, there's no balance component there and it's in a single plane of motion. 
Then from there, I would move to a reverse lunge. So now we've got, because I'm on one leg for a period of time, I've got a little bit of a balance component. I would progress to that. After that, I would go to a reverse kind of diagonal lunge to start to get in the other frontal plane and the transverse plane. Do that for a period. Then I would go to lateral lunge because that's gonna be a little more challenging uh, on the knee itself because it's not really great at the lateral, the frontal plane stability. It's not as strong there as it is in the other directions. And then after that, I would go to, I'm thinking twisting lunge where I'm twisting my upper body as I'm going down. Uh, so doing a reverse lunge, but then twisting my upper body over top of the leg that's in front. And then finally, I'm thinking I'm gonna go to lunge jumps so I can start to build in some of that plyometric. And with all of that stuff, I'm gonna start off with maybe two sets, you know, plenty of rest in between sets. So I'm not dealing with fatigue. I'm just trying to try to build strength and build that pattern back um, and progress it up to three sets of in the 10 to 12 repetition range. Do that each pattern for about a week or so, and then move on to the next pattern. So that's just what I was thinking as you're describing that from a practical mm -hmm. perspective, but what, what would you think about that kind of progression? I think that sounds perfect. I really like that. And I think if um, just at the very beginning, if people are really struggling and more for people who've got this patellofemoral pain in particular, like you've got no, say you have no swelling, you've got pain that's kind of like a, a you know, a two or a three out of 10, and you're having trouble just being in that split squat phase, um, taking your weight off of your body. So using a TRX, to use your arms a bit to unweight your body, but allow you to go through the movement is something that you can do um, to at least get the neuromuscular system firing. Um, you also though, if you're really struggling and say with the anterior knee pain and you're not able to do the lunge, you've gotta be looking elsewhere. You gotta be looking at your psoas, you gotta be looking at your ankle range to make sure that mechanically you're doing the exercise correctly. Because if, you, um, if you're having trouble progressing uh, in, in any of these movements, if you're not doing it technically properly, then you can be overloading the joint in a way that it shouldn't be overloaded. And so the principle will kind of fall, fall off to the wayside. So, mm. and I think we, we've, we've got uh, Joshua who can, you know, you can always contact, say you're doing an exercise program and, uh, and you know, you're not sure, then he can... He can help you to make sure that you're doing things technically correctly. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. So I'm going to get on that lunch pattern. I'll post that everybody after I get to the questions here and Dr. B's answering uh, if you're interested in, in following that progression. Uh, so we've got a lot of great questions here. I'm going to start at the top here. Uh, Susanna says hi, by the way. Oh, hi, um, hi Susanna. <laughs> the first question we've got from Grant Powers. Um, any direct experience with anyone recovering from paralysis labeled as rhabdomyolysis. I've been working on this for seven years and I haven't experienced any reduction in the constant pain. Uh, 71 years old, it was suggested to be from over prescription of meds, <clears throat> clonopin and hydrocodone for 16 years. And I think, PS, I've been working on this diligently for seven years now, um, but hasn't experienced any reduction in the constant pain. So I have no idea about that one. What do you think? Um, a little, I probably need a little more information, like why you're on hydrocodone to begin with. Like, you know, so the, that's it. Hydrocodone is a strong narcotic medication to treat pain. Uh, rhab rhabdomyolysis is when the muscle um, actually becomes inflamed and starts to break down. And it's a very serious medical condition uh, and can be a side effect um, from some drugs. Uh, I don't have a lot of experience with this grant, un unfortunately. Um, you know, it depends. I guess what your primary cause for pain was and why you're on the narcotic. So that's what I would be focusing on. Um, the muscle building up muscle um, endurance and strength, I would be following sort of the principles that Eric has just outlined in, in a progression. Um, but if you have pain because of the me a metabolic issue with the muscle, then it's a little hard to say, a little hard to say here. Okay, thank you for that, um, Dr. B and Grant. Hopefully, we can get some other answers from you or some info from you. Maybe we can, Dr. B can give you a little bit more. 
uh, advice there. So let's move on to Hockey Dave 23 next. I just finished your meniscus program three weeks ago and have returned to light skating. Not sure when or how to ramp it up and also how to incorporate running. What do you recommend, especially for running? And he's got no swelling, no acute pain, just 0 0.5 on mild tenderness at times. And he's 39, okay. former college athlete, never stopped playing, et cetera, no imaging. Awesome. Okay. Um, so this is a great question. And I think that um, the, the, the first thing that pops into my mind is why did you injure your meniscus in the first place? And uh, if you recall from, you know, our discussions about meniscus pathology previously, most meniscus problems come from a problem in your knee, in your ankle or your hip. So I would encourage you to um, take either the lower limb control course or the hip control course to address the potential issues. And if you're a hockey player, I would probably go to, what would you say, hip? I'd say hip control first. Yeah. And um, uh, because hockey leads to uh, imbalances in the muscles of your hip, which will then lead to problems in your knee. So if you can build the um, uh, mobility and you can awaken, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the neglected muscles in your hip, <clears throat> excuse me, through the hip control program, you're going to be uh, a lot more successful. Um, as far as it sounds to me like you're fine though, to start lightly, you can go out and you can skate, you can go in circles, you can do a little bit of stopping and starting, but keep it, keep it um, sort of 50% intensity where you're not like sprinting down the ice and stopping at a, on a dime, keep everything very even um, and, and smooth your turns, large, um, do a little bit of forwards, a little bit of backwards skating and, and see how it is, uh, and sort of build your time out on the ice as best you can. Uh, similarly with, uh, jogging, I would start out with, um, a very light jog. You can do a jog walk. Uh, so walk for, uh, a minute, jog for 30 seconds, walk for an, a minute, jog for 30 seconds. If that feels absolutely fantastic, then you can increase the amount or the ratio of jogging to walking, but keep it very simple when you first go out. And, and I actually really like people to get on a bike or be on a treadmill when they first start these things. So that if you're, if you do run into a, a stationary bike or a treadmill, if you run into problems, then you can get off the bike or you can get off the treadmill. Then you're not like 10 miles out and having to limp home because you can be fine for a certain period um, without overloading the joint. But if you just push it that little bit too far, then it can be very discouraging. So, uh, and, and then I think you should follow the principles of what Eric has been talking about with the lunges to, to um, build your strength. Because with hockey, you know, it's, there's a lot of cutting, pivoting, lateral movement, um, but you wanna try to keep things linear to begin with and then ramp up the requirements and intensity of your skating and the, the motion. The, the, where you get away with it in the skating is because your foot is moving and sliding on the ice instead of running and planting and stopping and changing direction. So skating can actually be a pretty good exercise, uh, but I don't know how much um, access you have to, to ice right now, so. Right on. I'm gonna post that lunge example right now. Um, and. I think from, from my perspective, because I did have a meniscus injury, pretty serious meniscus injury, and I was playing hockey at the time, um, the hip rotation is critical. Hip internal and external rotation for all the pivoting and the cutting, um, turn backs and all that stuff. The other little thing that I found was, and I started working on this maybe a few years back, but um, when you're skating, a lot of pressure on the heels. When I was a kid and there wasn't, that much instruction, but I was, we were always told, stay on your toes, stay on your toes. But I, I had a little lesson, one lesson with the skating coach a few years back. And he was like, that's not what you do. You should actually have most of your pressure on your heels when you're skating forwards. Um, that makes a big difference because when you're on your toes a lot, you can catch your toe when you're, you're cutting or just skating around. And that toe, if the toe gets caught and your knee gets, and your skate gets caught into the ice and you drag, you're dragging that leg behind you a little bit, that puts a lot of torque on the knee. And that could, um, that could really hurt a meniscus that's already a little bit vulnerable. So I, I would watch for that when you're skating as well, just from uh, my personal experience. 
Okay, so Hockey Dave. That's great. Have, That's great advice. If you have any other questions or any, any follow up, please feel free to drop it in. Uh, We're going to go to the next one, I think. Roger. Actually, let's touch on three slippers first. Tennis. She plays tennis. Current, currently can't play due to sore Achilles tendons, 43 years old. Um, and I think that's it. So. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> excuse me, if your Achilles tendons are painful and sore right now, then we have to start right at the very beginning and allow them to heal, let, allow the inflammation to settle down. Um, so you're in the relaxed phase. And I would be working a lot on um, foam rolling your calf, mobilizing all the little muscles in, or all the little joints in your, in your foot and your ankle, particularly the subtalar joint uh, can be stiff if you've got an Achilles tendon issue um, so that you're working on the tissue pliability, um, icing the Achilles tendon to settle down inflammation. Then you want to turn on all the little muscles that are in your, um, in your feet. And uh, Eric has got some great videos like weird little ankle uh, exercises um, there's a there's two or three little videos that you have on foot and ankle movements yeah, that um, that are on YouTube that that you could start doing, but honestly I think that you would be better um, better off to actually go into something like lower limb control, which will progress you through a a, a program. Uh, one of the problems, and this is something we've talked about a couple of weeks ago with the magic bullet exercises. You know, you go on YouTube and you get an exercise and it helps you but you don't end up progressing through a program in a way that you need to in order to really establish a foundation and then take you through the performance pyramid. So most people who have Achilles tendon problems um, that play tennis have issues with lack of mobility of their ankle and of the little joints in their feet, and they're not using their glutes well. So you need to have an exercise program that is going to address all of those issues while you, um, have the acute inflammation of your tendons settle down. And I also just sort of think in the back of my mind, whenever anybody has bilateral, that means right and left Achilles tendons, I'm thinking about your back. So you may have some issues with core strength. Um, and, and maybe what you should do is, is um, the assessment on the ROM coach and have a look to see where, you know, where your mobility issues are the most uh, pronounced and you can get started on the wrong coach. And um, if, you, if you have had back pain, I would do spine control combined with lower limb control. And you can alternate the days that um, you, you do each of these programs so that you really get yourself fixed and back on the tennis court because got to get you out there. Hmm. Yeah, with the, uh, the Achilles tendons, um, just a little insight. I, I've been thinking about this a lot lately just because I'm in the middle of creating a, a presentation on the lower limb or ankle and foot stuff and going over the research and all that stuff. But um, Achilles tendons, they're inflamed. Why are they inflamed? Why, are, why is that tissue, which could be the calves typically, why are the calves being overworked that's causing these tendons to be inflamed, irritated, sore? Um, that's the question that I have when I hear that. And it's, when you look at the anatomy, uh, there's a concept that I, I just term it functional overlap. What else, what would the calves kind of overlap with? What other muscles would they overlap with in terms of function? Where if those other muscles aren't working, that makes the calves try to come in and pick up the slack. So one of those muscles might be tip posterior. The tip posterior, it's got a similar uh, action it's got a similar path, origin, insertion. And if the tip posterior isn't working, the calves, even though they're not functionally perfect for that, because, well, the only muscle that's functionally perfect for the tip post work is the tip post. So everything else is compensating and doing a crappy job of it. Uh, so the calves might jump in there to, to help out. But what does the tip post do? The tip post helps to give you the arch in your foot, the medial arch. So I would have a question. My question would be, how are your feet? Do you have flat feet? Do you overpronate? Um, if you have either of those things, those are possibly 
the root source cause, uh, another place to look as look for the root source, root cause of your issue, and they definitely need to be addressed. Uh, so that is something that could be addressed with lower limb control. And that's one of the big, I think, takeaways that a lot of people who go through that course I hear from uh, is that, you know, learning how to de develop the arch. The arch is created muscularly, primarily by muscles. And then there's fascia there to support and ligaments in the bottom of the foot. But the arch is what uh, gives, or the muscles are, are what give you that arch. So if those muscles are weak, and they'll definitely be weak if you've been stuffing them in shoes for, for your life, then you got to strengthen them. Once you strengthen them, then benefits move up the chain. You can go up to your ankle, up to your knee, up to your hip. Uh, you can go all the way up, but that's something to to look at. And definitely lower limb control is, is uh, I would strongly recommend that for you. Yeah, that's okay. great. I like it. Okay. Uh, Roger, so Roger's got a question here. He is about to start, he's a 67 year old male and will be competing in his first sanctioned meet, 50, 100 and 200 meter sprints. That's cool. Awesome. Um, He's in week 10 of the lower limb control course, and he's been following it to try to prevent a reoccurrence of plantar fasciitis that he experienced a year ago. It's been going very well and improving strength in ROM. Uh, about two weeks ago, sustained a mild groin injury, either practicing starts or doing other training. It's especially noticeable if I do the reverse slide lunge from lower limb control or during the drive phase of my sprint. In the reverse lunges, I'm fine on my, stand, on my left leg and lunging back on the right but the opposite side produces pain on the lower right side of my groin. I've started following the advice from the three exercises to heal adductor strain, including things like backing off lunges. I've also tried rubbing Voltaren on the affected area as a means of helping re reduce the inflammation. I expect that I will have a suboptimal meet, but I will compete. I was wondering if there's anything you can suggest that I do between now and Saturday, or probably more <laughs> realistically after the meet. Um, so this is a good question. I mean, you got yeah. two days until Saturday. Uh, what would you do in that case? I would get my fingers around your adductor. The adductor can sometimes stick to the hamstring. Um, so if you can, it, it's kind of hard to show it, but basically if it my body, so I don't know if you can see that. Um, I could try to demo it. Yes. Okay. So basically you're going to put your, you're going to put your fingers around the adductor. So you're going to feel between the adductor muscle and the, uh, on the front of your leg, it's going to be, um, the adductor magnus and the smaller adductor muscles. And then in the back of your uh, leg, it's going to be the adductor in your hamstring. So you can see how Eric is putting his fingers around the bicep muscle there. So you're going to do a similar thing, but on the inside of your thigh, inside of your thigh. I'm not showing that. <laughs> and then, sure so then what I would want you to do is you're going to put your fingers there, you hold it there, and then you take your leg through a range of motion. So you're going to take your, your knee. So you would bend and straighten your knee. Then you're going to move your fingers up a little farther and you're going to bend and straighten your knee. And then you're going to move them up a little farther so that you go along the whole length of the muscle. And I would foam roll. Um, I would foam roll the muscle. Um, and uh, really make sure that your psoas is turned on and working properly. So Eric has got a really good um, um, YouTube live that he did on psoas activation. Make sure that that is on. And finally, you might want to consider um, putting on a compression sleeve for the meat. Uh, it can help keep it warm. Um, make sure that you're really well warmed up but not fatigued. And um, do all of that just active self myofascial release. And I guess even better, go to a professional and get them to get them to do it for you. You know, if you have access, if you don't have access, then you can try this yourself. But if you can go and um, often at meets, they've got guys that are really good at this stuff, get them to go and loosen up your adductor, tell them what's going on. And um, uh, yeah, and then and have fun. And let us know what happens. Good luck. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Um, how about in between races? He's got three races or multiple races in one day. What would you recommend in between? Um, I would do a very brief um, rebalance, reactivate of, of 
each of his problem issues. So to prevent the plantar fasciitis, he would do probably, it's going to be like a 15, a little 15 minute routine where you just kind of make sure all the little joints in your foot are mobilized. Um, you're going to turn on the little muscles in your feet. And then I would repeat the active self myofascial release and foam roll of your adductor. You shouldn't stretch your adductor because that'll turn it off and not going to help the situation. The adductor is tight because of something else. Um, and it, it could be, um, I'm finding a relationship between psoas and adductor. I don't know what you think here, uh, Eric, but the little rotators in the hip are also very important. Um, abductor, abductors, like it's got to have a good balance of the muscles. So um, I would uh, do active self myofascial release, but then I would do a very gentle side bridge to turn the muscle on, but not fatigue it. Mm. And um, you could do, depending on how much time you have, you might want to ice it down immediately after the race, ice it. If you've, if you've got a couple of hours, then you could do the hot, cold contrast in a shower if you have access to a shower. If you don't, then I would ice it and then go through the release the muscle, activate the muscle, um, and then put the compression sleeve on and then go do it again. Okay, cool. That's, that's great advice. Um, if it's, I remember from a hockey tournament that I played a few years ago, I was having some, some adductor, I think it was just soreness because it's a multi-day tournament so by the the sunday i was just so sore but uh what i was doing was i had this glass water bottle that was like a, i don't know it was about that diameter and i just stuck it in the freezer and i would use that to roll um mm -hmm. my adductor right after my game Perfect. so that that kind of kills two birds with one stone with a bit of yep. compression and myofascial release with uh with some icing and it just, it feels good. I mean, if you're in, in between matches and you've got some time in between meets, then, then it'll just help you feel a little bit better. Uh, yeah, I, know. I, I really like these, um, just that when I was thinking about the compression, the Under Armour core shorts, and mm. they could be something that you could get a hold of, if you can get a hold of them, um, that, that could just give you that little bit of extra protection, a little extra feel. Uh, it helps proprioceptively. And I actually did a little ultrasound study looking at compression. Um, and when you, when you look at uh, a muscle, the, you've got the tendon, say my hand is the tendon, and then there's the pination angle. So you've got the muscle fibers coming into the tendon and the pination angle varies depending on the specific muscle. When you put compression, you actually change the pination angle. And mm -hmm. I think you can actually feel, I, I don't know, like I've worn compression sleeves before and sometimes you feel like you've got a little spring in your step as mm -hmm. though you've changed that pination angle very slightly. Um, and, and I think that it also helps with activating uh, because of skin proprioception. So, uh, and it keeps you warm. So I would really try to get a, my hands on either a, a sleeve that can give you good compression or the core shorts. Cool. Yeah, that's great advice. Okay. So let's see if who's next. Roger after Roger, Amanda Trail. Amanda Trail, I was diagnosed with PFS three years ago. Um, while the kneecap pain is mostly gone, I still have pain above the patella when I walk or cycle, like it will burst, and medial, medial pain in the origin where it popped. And I thought I saw another message from her, maybe not. So I guess that is the message. Okay, so. Uh... PFS is patellofemoral syndrome, for those of you who don't know. Um, so that's pain around the kneecap. And um, from where you're describing the pain up around the quadriceps tendon insertion, it makes me think about a tight rec fem, uh, which makes me think about a psoas being turned off, that the rec fem is flexing your hip. It's a muscle that crosses the hip and the knee. And the rec fem extends your knee and flexes your hip. Um, and if you're, so if your psoas is not flexing your hip, your rec fem starts to do that and it's always tight. And then it changes because that muscle's tight. It changes how your kneecap is tracking and the pressure underneath your kneecap. So I would be foam rolling your, um, quad, your IT band. I'd foam roll everything around your leg, uh, but focusing a lot on the rec fem and then turning on the psoas so that you can have the rec fem relax and, Eric did a really good YouTube live um, 
with, that's when you have the active hamstring mm. to get your knee flexion. Um, yeah. Advanced hamstring exercises or something like that. And, but it, I'll find it. It was where, yeah, where you had us um, in the child's pose, but actively flexing that yeah. one and, um, and then the psoas. That's what I would recommend for you to do to, to deal with this. And it can go away. It's amazing. Okay, so I think there's a, I did follow, I'll find another message from Amanda here. Okay. Um, just a little more info, both times, a few, oh wait, sorry. The injury happened in both knees, three months apart. I deadlifted slash one leg hopped right to left knee, I guess. And then I did a hamstring stretch. The pop in the lower medial part of my knees happened while stretching. And then both times, a few days after exercise and taking a big, Break the knee gave out while just walking normally, shifting laterally, not to the extent of dislocation, but still debil debilitating. MRIs are normal. Um, was 29 at the time of the injury and was a competitive rower, martial artist, and hiked regularly. Only weight lifted to help correct imbalances from the sports I did. I guess I'm wondering how to best progress as physio strength training for the quads has not helped with the remaining pain I have, and PFS doesn't seem to account for what I have now. So I, I think uh, you need to address the imbalance. Most likely it's an imbalance in your hip. You got to look at your hip and your ankle. Um, and, and so I would get into one of the progressive programs or do both of them, you know, lower limb control and hip control. Um, I don't know which one, Eric, you would recommend first based on this, but um, you know, it's, you're probably going to have to do both because they're both, your foot is important. How your foot goes on the ground is critical but also what's going on in your hips and um, getting those little hip rotators functioning properly, getting your psoas turned on um, are going to be critical for your knee health. Mm -hmm. And uh, one more follow-up comment I found here. My knees still give out from time to time, usually after repetitive loaded movements, such as walking a bunch of stairs or trying to go on a longer flat hike with a backpack. So it could be that you're fatigued and um, you're getting this sensation. I'm not sure if your patella has actually gone out of joint. It, it doesn't sound like it's frankly dislocated. It, you, you, know, you get a feeling of it, but the fact that your MRI is normal, that there's no ligament stretching or damage, there's no fluid in your knee, um, that, that's all really positive stuff. So sometimes we have giving way because of pain, particularly if it's um, in activities where, where it's like stairs, where you're not cutting and pivoting it's not so much of a structural issue. Uh, it's more of a functional issue. So building your strength and endurance um, will help with that sensation, I believe. Mm -hmm. Cool. It's unnerving. You know, you get that feeling and it, you're, you're afraid that it's going to happen. And so it's important to sort of build the strength in a controlled way so that you feel confident. But then when you're tired, you know that you're a little bit more vulnerable to this feeling. So you just kind of have to push the envelope so that you get to a point where you're able to, to have the strength. So you're not getting that sensation. Mm -hmm. That's one of the, the reasons why in the lower limb control course in the third phase, phase three, I've included some plyometrics and jump type exercises because mm -hmm. you, you need to build that stuff up if you're still participating in, in any sports or even for the lower body, I mean, even running, um, you'll wanna build up jumping, jumping mechanics, landing mechanics, and those types of things in with using the new muscle activation patterns that you've developed through phases one and phase two. So that's one thing that I think a lot of athletes or uh, weekend warriors miss, it, miss out on in their rehab is the plyometrics for the lower body, and the jumping type exercises uh, to train those and build them up progressively as opposed to just going back into your, your sport or your class where you're jumping and you're trying to do it at max. Um, you've never built it up though. Uh, that could be an issue. That's for sure, Eric. And I think it, that's just really highlights what you've said here is just highlights the concept of the performance pyramid where you need to build endurance, strength, power, speed. And also while you're building your strength, power, speed, you're building tissue tolerance so mm -hmm. that the tissues are having an opportunity to adapt to that plyometric movement in a safe and progressive way so that you're not just suddenly overloading all of the tissue with a plyometric movement. So I, I love that. Okay. Um, next up, we have gifted genetics. Been reading some <laughs> books about getting back to sports after ACL injury, and amongst many other things stated in advanced stages, 
practice cutting and pivoting motion while running, but I'm not able to do that. Also, there's stiffness and grinding in the knee and movement is not smooth and natural as before pre-injury, despite doing lots of physio, had MRI done, there's no parts stuck. So how to, one, do twisting and sharp cutting motion when running and standing, two, able to move knees stiffness free and smoothly, 24 year old male, otherwise perfectly healthy. Did you have surgery to have your ACL fixed or are you ACL deficient? Uh, that would be the first question. But what I'm thinking just from listening is that his patellofemoral joints not moving well. So he needs to get his kneecap moving up and down and side to side in a much better way. Um, oftentimes you'll feel or you'll hear grinding underneath your kneecap if it gets stuck. When you tear your ACL, the ACL bleeds into the joint. That's called a hemarthrosis. With the blood in the joint, then the fat pad can get a little inflamed. And then that inflammation can kind of capture the patella and prevent the kneecap from sliding up and down in a normal direction the way it should when you flex and extend your, your, uh, your knee. So then instead of the kneecap moving up and down, it kind of gets pushed into the end of your femur and that creates pain and overload and breakdown. So, uh, and then that can, you can get the cracking feeling and catching and, and pain. So you need to kind of take a step back from cutting and pivoting and making sure that your hips and your ankle are mobile, that you've got your good mobility, the patellofemoral joint, so that you have your foundation of movement and then progress through the steps that Eric has outlined with the lunges. Because if you go through that progression, you'll then start to be able to rotate and if you can do all of the lunges and eventually the final progression of the lunge, then that should allow you to start getting back into more dynamic cutting and pivoting. Cool. Um, yeah, I think this is something that Dr. B teaches really, really well in the meniscus, the knee meniscus program uh, that we have, which is mobilizing the patella and the tibiofibular joint, which we just talked about with respect to my knee as well. Um, these are two things that I had never done before until I learned them from Dr. B. And I think they're, they'll be instrumental in this kind of situation because Dr. B, this, these things are, these techniques are things that you would apply to pretty much any knee injury. Right? Yes. Yes, for sure. And, you know, it's, this, these are the little areas where people get stuck. You know, you can have an injury where you don't have a problem with patellofemoral joint or the tibiofemoral joint and or proximal tib fib joint. So they kind of, you go get physio, they do their thing um, and you get better. But when things are more complex and you've got these subtle little issues that prevent you from really establishing your foundation for movement, um, I think they'll make a big difference. And, and it's, it's also really important when you have an ACL injury is to understand what it is about your movement that led to your ACL tearing in the first place. It's one thing if a 300 pound football player landed on it and you tore your ACL, but it's another thing if you were playing basketball and you jumped and landed and hyperextended your knee and blew your ACL. That tells me that you have uh, an imbalance in the hip or the ankle that need to be addressed so that you don't overload your knee again in the future. So hip control, lower limb control, um, possibly avoid the meniscus, avoid the knife meniscus program to and I'd probably start there with getting just yeah. the initial stages to get your foundation for movement and then progress to one of the other two programs mm -hmm. uh, so that you can move because you're young. So there's no reason that we can't get you back and, and, and doing what you love to do. Yeah, you're saying you had ACL surgery done twice. Same knee, I guess, or it can happen. Knees? So, so, um, you know, barring a, a surgical technical issue, um, I wonder, and, and going back too soon, sometimes that can lead to failure of the graft. But this just highlights to me, hmm, how is it that you're moving, that you're overloading this ACL? You know, you, you tore it once, you have it fixed, and if you don't change how you move, then you're susceptible to tearing it again. So you, I really encourage you to understand your root movement issue, which is going to deal with your hip and your core and your foot and your ankle. <laughs> And so it's kind of a complex problem, but because you've had two surgeries on your knee, it sounds to me like your, your kneecap isn't moving well. So we've got to get that dealt with first and then work above and below. Yeah, and then you'll be knee. fine. <laughs> <laughs> same knee he's saying, or she yeah. is saying. So, um, yeah. And when I get, when I see ACL, um, 
especially the, the double surgery here. It's, I, I would also look at hamstring, like to hone in on the hamstring and to make sure that thing is strong and functional and it's doing what it's supposed to, supposed to be doing. So it's, it's gotta be smart. It's gotta be mm-hmm. strong. It's gotta be smart. So training it uh, with exercises like uh, stiff like a deadlift, normal deadlift, stiff like a deadlift, but also stability ball leg curls. Uh, I, I really like those exercises for the hamstrings because those could, could play a role as well. But everything, like that whole lower chain, the, the number one risk factor for ACL injury is having a previous ACL injury. And the reason why Dr. B pointed to is because you're not addressing the root movement cause. So the stuff that we do with our, our programs and our courses um, addresses stuff that you don't often see elsewhere. Like you're just, if you're just doing squats and lunges and deadlifts, you're not getting all the muscles and movements and not training all the movements that we have in the courses like lower limb control and hip control. Uh, so definitely take a look at that for, for your long-term movement health and longevity. Okay, I think we got, uh, I got time for a couple more questions here. I think I got to take off in a bit. Um, so I'm going to scroll back up and see. I've got a lot, of, a lot of stuff to go through. Um, here's a quick one from Vatsell. I'm positive for the fatter test, the impingement, mm-hmm. uh, hip impingement, internal rotation test. How much time do you think it'll take me to get back on the soccer field? Okay. Okay, well, I guess it depends on what you do. Like if you just rest and you don't do anything else, you're going to go back out in the soccer field and you may feel fine initially, but the problem is going to come back. So this is a message to you that you need to change how you're loading your hip. And so I would suggest that you do hip control because it's going to waken up all those little muscles that are asleep and you're potentially asleep and leading to this painful impingement in your hip. And then um, if it's a relatively new injury, you could be back out on the soccer field pretty quickly, but I really encourage you to do the hip control course regularly, do it to, uh, you can do, do moves to warm up your hip before you go out so that you've got good mobility. The hip scouring is really good so that you've done really good um, release of all the little muscles around your hip before you, and, and then you turn on all the little muscles in your hip before you go out and play. And then uh, afterwards, um, you can do uh, sort of a rebalancing act again, because every time you go and play soccer, you're going to be recreating the potential injury or imbalance. So you need to get that rhythm of balancing your body, going and creating imbalance and play soccer, and then rebalancing again. So based on the information you've told me. Mm-hmm. There you go. So that's all. I posted a link to uh, where you can get, see all the courses and programs that we have uh, in the chat. Super. So here's a, here's a question from Whistle Whistle. History of right knee issues, ligament, meniscus. Any advice on starting judo? Would knee guards help with impact? He's 28 year old male. Um, Before you start judo, I want to know that you've got a foundation for movement. Um, You know, that's probably the number one thing. And and so um, maybe going through the ROM coach assessment to look at your mobility and your ability to do certain moves will give you a good clue as to where to start, uh, whether it's going to be at the hip, whether it's your core, whether it's your foot and ankle. Um, But regardless of knee guards or not, you've got to have that foundation for movement and be in a, be in a a state in your strength, power and speed before you're going out and competing with judo. Um, Eric, you're more familiar with knee guards. Um, Why don't you comment on that? Um, I'm not sure what kind of knee guards he would be talking about, but maybe the the braces, those kind of Robocop braces. uh, Think of them okay. but I'm, I'm not sure which ones you'd be doing but if you've got a history of knee injuries judo is not looking good um, <laughs> because when you're getting thrown like you're, you're landing you could be th- getting thrown you try to resist it but you're planting on a foot like to me that depending on what the ligament and meniscus issues you have but there's a lot of rotational torque on the 
on the legs in judo. And when you're throwing people, it's the same thing. You're, you're the one that's generating the torque, but you're doing it in a rotational way. Um, often on one leg, you're, you'll be balancing on with one leg planted. So you've got to really look at hip mobility there. So that, because if you have limited hip mobility, all that force, all that rotational force is going to go straight through your knee. And uh, that's, the knee is not designed for that. So hip rotational mobility is something that I would look at as a, a very high priority, especially if it's limited. Um, and then from there, it's working on, working on everything. Uh, Cause you, you'll need it all in judo. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, okay. Let's go to Caroline's question here. Where's, sorry. Okay, here. Do you have exercises for back pain mid thoracic along the bra line in the back? Or what do you think about that? Um, so I would be thinking, yeah, well, the short answer is yes. Eric has got amazing exercises. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, most of the time people who have pain that's right at the junction uh, of the bra line, you know, where the thoracolumbar spine is, is that there's a control, there's a uh, stability um, issue that when you go to lift your shoulders back, you're hyperextending your back or uh, you're, you're potentially are missing some rotation. Um, what do you think Eric starting out maybe with the hunchback series of exercises uh, or just go to yeah. spine control would be the ideal thing, honestly. Um, you know, it, it, the, the Eric takes you, you through a series of things that you can do, um, to decompress your spine, uh, to activate the correct muscles in your core and the muscles that are, are in your back. Um, and you, it's, it, it goes through a progressive, um, program that incorporates not just the, the core, but your, your hips and your shoulders as well. So you're getting the whole deal because you know, if you, if you just deal with mobilizing and strengthening specifically at the bra line, the bra line muscles, you're not going to address the lats. You're not going to address the glutes. You're not going to address all these other muscles that have connections and impact this part of your back. And um, so that's what I really like about the spine control. Yeah, you're going to hit pretty much everything in different patterns, different positions. Uh, yep. So it's as comprehensive as I could make it without mm -hmm. making it uh, last two years. Um, so that, that's what I would recommend as well, getting, getting into that course, and working yep. through it, taking your time, working through it. Uh, we got a ton of good questions. I hate to leave too early. I, I can. Well, you know what? Bit. We can, but also maybe if we've got so many good questions, we'll just follow up next week with a question session. We won't do any presentation if we've got that many questions because um, we love answering questions. Yeah, yeah, there's some good ones here. You know what? Let's end with this one because it's related to today's topic. And apologies for not being able to get to everybody's question today, but like Dr. B and I, Dr. B had just said, next week we will cover the questions that we missed. So if you left a question, yeah and you didn't get it answered, come back next week and we'll answer it. Um, and we've got it covered. Or you can just come back and ask again. Uh, it's up to you. But we'll end with this last one because it's related to return to play. Let me mm -hmm. just find it. Sports. Uh, oops, trying to search. OK. There's so many I'm having trouble finding them. That's great. We love questions. This is fantastic. Okay, from Prema, any comment on training load versus training intensity influences on athlete return to play? So I know you did comment on it a little bit, but let's uh, summarize your, your thoughts again on that. Well, I, so I think it's really important that you increase the load on the tissues in a very gradual way so that the tissues actually have a chance to hypertrophy, to strengthen, to prepare for that intensity uh, when you're ready to go to the intensity part of uh, the training. So um, when you when, remember Wolf's law, that when you load the musculoskeletal tissues, uh, they will respond to that load by increasing in their strength. So we want to load the tissues in a controlled way uh, and with motion 
so that we can create the strength um, of the tissue along the line of motion that you're going to require. But we have to do it in a progressive way because the body needs time to build up the tissue. Uh, so I believe in loading in a controlled, lower intensity fashion and then build in intensity as you feel stronger. And that feeling that Eric is describing or described earlier today with the feeling of just kind of a little weakness or not quite right. It's a combination of the, the body is telling him we're not ready for more load. Um, so listen to that. If you have that feeling, um, as you're doing your training. Mm -hmm. And you had mentioned earlier also upping and focusing on duration over intensity. So Correct. focus first on duration and then focus on intensity. So for a jog example, it's going out for a light jog and increasing the time maybe from five minutes to 30 minutes. And then once you get to that 30 minute mark, maybe it takes you a period of, let's say four weeks. Once you're at that 30 minute mark, then you start to increase your speed and do some, some intervals where you're going a little faster pace and then walk a little faster. So something like that. Exactly. And it's, and, and so it's focus on form first. So um, rhythm, so it can be rhythm of jogging, or if it's an upper extremity, say you want to serve at first, you're going to go out and you're just going to serve really low intensity, like 40 or 50%, and maybe only serve from service line to service line, but you're getting the rhythm of the movement and you have to be doing it without any compensations and good mechanics. You build a duration in that, and then, as Eric said, you then you then you go from 50% intensity. Once you have a duration that, you know, say you can do 100 serves comfortably at 50% duration and you've moved from the service line to the baseline and you're, you're, you're great, then you can go up to 60% and you might do 10 at 60%, 10 at 50%. 10, well, it's kind of hard to just do 10%, but say 40% and then 70%. And you're sort of you know, varying the intensity. Again, you're um, always wanting to maintain form. And as soon as you lose your form, you gotta, you gotta cut off, you gotta cut off and you've got to either rest. And if you start to get pain, then you have to go back to the lower intensity um, level of, uh, of training. So you're building the tissue, you're building your tolerance, uh, you're building your health, you're using good mechanics, and then you're progressing in uh, with that over time. So I think that's that's great advice there. You gotta you definitely gotta load it up over time. Take it slow um, and don't go. Give your give your body rest in between training sessions. So even if your training session is at fifty percent and your you know it's fifteen minute jog at fifty percent of your normal pace, give your day your body the next day off just so you can see how it feels in your everyday life. Um, as opposed to trying to do it every day. I think that's, what do you think about that? Uh, well, I think it's so important. This is the rhythm of recovery. You know, this mm -hmm. is where paying attention to all the other things and you can do a different activity, you know, like you can mm -hmm. do your core workout or you can do, uh, you know, depending on what body part has been injured, but you can do, you know, say it's your knee, then you can do core, you can do shoulders, you can do some other workout the next day that is giving your knee a break. Um, and allowing your knee to adapt, but you're still able to do something. So it's, it's listening to your body, listening to the tissues. If you find after you do the exercise that you've lost mobility, that you feel really stiff, that you're, you've got some swelling, then you know that you're not ready to progress, that you either have to back off a little uh, again and give it a few more days and give yourself the time to recover. And if you feel a little stiff the next day, but then the next day you're fine, okay then you can maybe go back to it, you know, and, and then you, but you don't, you don't increase your intensity. You stay at the same level. And then the next day you may not be stiff. Could it, you know, could just be that you've got a little DOMS or something like that. So it's, it's really allowing your body to recover from the increased load so that you can keep progressing. Awesome. Okay. So that was today's session. Everybody, thank you for showing up and for all the great questions if you've left a question here and we didn't answer it um dr b and i will we'll get to it next thursday
at noon Eastern. And uh, one thing that I just wanted to, to leave with, leave off with, I posted a link in the chat here um, to Dr. B's coaching service. And like I said earlier, when I was dealing with my knee injury, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't, it wasn't severe enough where I needed to go to, to my doctor and get a, and I didn't feel like I needed an X-ray or MRI or anything like that, but I still didn't know what was going on. didn't feel good. Um, and just Dr. B spending two minutes taking a look at it, asked me a few questions and giving me, you know, this is what I think is going on. These two things might be going on. And the, that reassurance of, okay, just do these simple things. And this is kind of like your timeline. Um, that was huge for me for mentally to know what, what's going on and what to expect. So there's not just all this, and there's enough uncertainty with life these days. Um, and I didn't need any more of that. So just that certainty, that reassurance was, was huge. So if you've, um, if you're dealing with something that, you know, is confusing you, you've been dealing with it for a long time, and maybe you're not confident in the opinions you're getting um, from your team right now, then that's something that I, I would highly recommend you consider because uh, from a get back to sport activity or the gym or get back to movement perspective, I think there's probably no better orthopedic surgeon around um, in the world. And I, I don't give these types of accolades very, very often. Um, and I don't definitely don't give them lightly. So consider that. Oh, so, well, yeah, thanks a lot for saying that, Eric. And also, you know, if you have a team of people already, um, bring your team and we can all discuss it. You know, like it's because it, it, it takes a village sometimes. So, but I, I think having, having a plan is really important to recovery. You know, it's, it's just, oh, we're going to wait and see what happens. No, you want to make a plan and you don't have to stick to it like perfectly. If you, if you have a little blip in the road, that's okay. Um, but having a plan, I think is really good for the mind because the mind is important in your recovery from your injury. So thank you for that, Eric. Mm. Uh, you're very welcome. So everybody, thanks again for showing up. And if you left a question, we'll get to it next week and you can bring new questions next week as well. So yep. hope to see you then. Until then, awesome. take care. Peace. Hey, you're stealing my sign off. What's going on?